All right, so all eyes on India's presidency of the G20. The country is pulling out all stops to make sure that this is a memorable one and perhaps even a historic one if they're able to uh, eke out a joint statement that is, yes, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin will not be in the room when the leaders of the 20 most powerful economies of the world will be meeting, but will that be a dampener or will India be able to bring all parties together? Joining me now on what we can expect over the next few days as India hosts this jamboree of some of the most powerful men and women on the planet is uh, Professor John Mearsheimer. He's the head of Department of Politics at the University of Chicago. Thank you very much, Professor Mearsheimer, for speaking with us. Uh, so India has had in the run-up to this big summit this weekend uh, 200 meetings across 60 cities, all connected to the G20, uh, in effect making it some kind of a people's presidency of the G20. And Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi had written a blog today saying how uh, they've expanded this just from the capital city to the length and breadth of this country. Have you seen anything like this in the 20-odd in the years that the G20 has been in existence? And do you, how, how do you read the way the country has sort of democratized uh, this summit itself, this summit which is supposed to be that of uh, an elite grouping of some of the most powerful people uh, on the planet, has been democratized and taken to the people? Well, I think that inside of India, that's a, a matter that's paid much attention. But outside of India, I don't think people are focusing on the, the democratizing of the G20. I think what people are focusing on is how badly fractured uh, the G20 is and how deep the economic and political divisions are. And I think for that reason, this G20 meeting will attract an enormous amount of attention and it will bring a lot of attention to India. But it's that divisiveness that we see at play here that's what really matters for focusing attention on the G20. Tell us a little bit more about that divisiveness because since the G20 was formed, I mean, informally you had the first meeting in 1999, but that was at the level of finance ministers, central bank governors, this was on the back of the Asian financial crisis. It really sort of took off after 2008, after the global financial crisis, when they started meeting at the level of heads of state or heads of government. Then the sense was multilateralism is the way to go. That's the way to deal with the complex challenges that the world faces. But now, are you suggesting that the multilateralism of the last 10, 15 years is pretty much dead? Well, dead is too strong a word, uh, but it's on life support for sure. I mean, what's happened here is that in those early years that you were just describing, we lived in the unipolar moment. The United States was the dominant country on the planet and it played a key role in establishing this liberal international order which the G20 fit into. But what happened right around 2017, 2018 is that the world uh, moved away from unipolarity into multipolarity. And once you go into a multipolar world, that liberal international order is going to begin to crack. And then what happened in particular is that the U.S.-China rivalry really heated up. Uh, and then uh, in 2022, we got the Ukraine war, which has further exacerbated the tensions inside the G20 and more generally inside uh, the international order. So you now have a very contentious uh, institution in terms of the G20, which is very different than what you had in the unipolar moment. We do know, you did mention about uh, China, you did mention about Russia, and we know that the leaders of both Russia and China, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, will not be coming for the Delhi G20. Uh, it may be coincidental, it may be for different reasons, but do you see some kind of an acting in concert by both Beijing and Moscow in a way to send a message, if not to India, the host, but certainly to the United States and to its Western partners who seem to be dominating the G20? I don't think that the uh, Chinese and the Russians were acting together here, that they coordinated uh, their decisions not to attend. 
I think they had independent reasons for not being present uh, for the G20 meeting. And I don't think that what the Russians and the Chinese have done by not coming to India is directed at India at all. Uh, I think it's directed at the United States. As everybody knows, there is a huge amount of animosity towards the United States outside of the West. And that includes uh, China and Russia. Uh, and in countries like India, you see this animosity as well. And that includes, again, countries like South Africa. So there's a, a lot of animosity towards the United States. And that's what contributes to this uh, divisiveness that you'll see at the G20 conference. Because of the Ukraine war, uh, there was huge difficulty in trying to agree to the language of a common text, a, a joint statement, if you will, even in the last G20 in Bali in Indonesia, but somehow they were able to thrash one uh, out. Because both the leaders of Russia and China are absent this time in the Delhi G20, how much more difficult would it be to A, thrash out a joint statement, and if they cannot, at the end of it, uh, would that then necessarily deem the Delhi leg of the G20 as uh, not successful? Well, I think that no matter who is there to represent Russia or China, that person is not going to agree to any language uh, that Russia or China views as hostile. So in terms of crafting language, I don't think it matters whether Putin or Xi Jinping are there. Uh, and the fact is that uh, just like you had trouble crafting language in Indonesia, you're going to have trouble crafting language again. Uh, the United States and Russia uh, are at odds, uh, deep odds, on how to deal with Ukraine, how to think about Ukraine, how to talk about Ukraine. So getting them to agree on any common language is almost impossible. And the Chinese are uh, at loggerheads with the United States as well, and they're backing the Russians. So I think that uh, India is not going to succeed uh, in pushing the G20 to produce some sort of meaningful language about the Ukraine crisis. But that's not India's fault. It's just a fact of life, uh, given the Ukraine war and given where U.S.-Russian and U.S.-Chinese relations are at today. So in this emerging great power competition between the United States and its uh, Western allies on the one side and then Russia and China on the other, what is the role of third party countries like India, which may not necessarily want to pick a side uh, in this? Uh, we saw the recent BRICS summit where, for example, uh, a large number of countries were invited to be part of BRICS. It is becoming some kind of a voice of the global south, if you will. What's the elbow room that some of these countries, India included, have in this great power competition, which I guess is going to define our, our times uh, for the foreseeable future? I think that's true for sure. Uh, I think India is in a good situation. I wouldn't say it's a wonderful situation, but I think it's in a good situation. I mean, let's talk first about the economic dimension, then the political dimension. I think economically that India benefits from the present situation because the Russians are in a situation where they have no choice but to sell oil uh, to countries like India at a very low price. So this is good for uh, India economically. Politically, uh, the United States, of course, has put pressure on India uh, to join the West uh, against Russia. The Indians have wisely rejected that uh, pressure from the United States, and it's not caused India any problems. So India is sort of walking a fine line between Russia on one side and the United States on the other side. And then with regard to India's relations with China, this is a very complicated matter, as I don't have to tell an Indian audience. But the fact is that the Chinese and the Indians have been pushed together uh, in important ways as a result of the Ukraine crisis uh, and as a result of America's heavy-handed policies. But at the same time, there is this huge potential for trouble involving the India-China border, and that's not going to go away. So India-China relations are not going to be good forever. 
But uh, at the moment, they're looking quite good. And uh, so I think India is in a sweet spot at this point in time. So I want to go back to something you said earlier about how you believe multilateralism may not be dead, but it certainly is on life support. To deal with some of the biggest challenges that we are, as a people, as, uh, as, as humanity are facing, whether it's climate change, whether it's global financial stability, whether it is dealing with you know, inflation and, and runaway prices and this cost of living crisis, you need you know, the biggest countries of the world to be able to agree on a common method and a common approach. If that is fundamentally broken between the West on the one side and Russia, China on the other, how are we going to fix these big problems? Well, the answer is you're not going to do a very good job fixing them. And uh, the fact is that when you have great powers uh, that have common interests, and I think what you're saying is that the great powers on the planet, in fact, every country on the planet has a common interest in, for example, dealing with the environmental crisis. But the problem that you face here is that when the dominant states in the system, the great powers, are involved in an intense security competition and are even involved in a war. And I think basically you have a war going on between the United States and Russia in Ukraine. In those circumstances, it's very hard to get the great powers to cooperate on those issue areas where they have common interests. So getting the United States, Russia and China to cooperate on climate change to get them to continue cooperating on nuclear proliferation is going to be very difficult in the years ahead because that security competition, that intense security competition in this multipolar world between those countries overshadows uh, the incentives that they have for cooperation. All of this is a way of saying we're in big trouble. So Prime Minister Modi, in one of the meetings that happened last year, had told Russian President Vladimir Putin that this is not the era of war, it's the era of peace, and that, of course, uh, drew him a lot of global uh, applause. Do you believe that India, as a neutral third-party country, could be in a position to try and see if the warring parties, in this case Ukraine and Russia, are able to come to some kind of an understanding? What is your best assessment of where the war stands right now and how it's likely to end. Well, let me just say about India that I think India, because it has good relations with Russia and has good relations with the United States, is in a very important way well situated to negotiate some sort of settlement over Ukraine if there is a potential settlement or peace agreement available. And the fact is, there is no potential peace agreement between the two sides. So India is not going to be in a position where it can do anything, even though, again, it has good relations with the two warring parties here. Uh, there's just no agreement on the table, which leads me into your other question, which is, where is this one headed? Uh, I think this one... Uh, is uh, showing no signs of coming to an end anytime soon. Uh, and I think, if anything, the war will go on for one, two, maybe even three more years. Uh, and when it ends, uh, I think the Russians will have won. Not, they will not have won a decisive victory, but they will have won a limited victory, or what I like to call an ugly victory. And what you'll get is a frozen conflict. You're not going to get any meaningful peace agreement, as I said earlier. Uh, you'll get a frozen conflict, and it'll be a constant danger that that frozen conflict will once again escalate into a hot war. So we are in deep trouble on the Ukraine front for as far as the eye can see. And finally, as, as India gets itself ready to host the most powerful men and women on the planet, the heads of the 20 most powerful economies, what will be your one benchmark or yardstick that you will be looking out for? Because if it crosses that yardstick or benchmark, then India would have done a good job of successfully hosting uh, a G20. Well, I think that the best that India can hope for is to make sure that the discourse uh, at the G20 summit is civil uh, and that people, in effect, talk about the issues on the table 
in an intelligent way. It would not be good if there was some sort of outburst or some sort of conflict between two or three of the important parties uh, at the G20 meeting. But there's, in my opinion, really no hope of making any meaningful progress and solving the big issues of the day at this G20 meeting. And it has nothing to do with India. It just has to do with the fact that there are powerful structural forces at play at this point in time that make it almost impossible for any country, India included, uh, to push the world in a meaningful way uh, towards a more peaceful environment or to get more cooperation right. on things like climate control. All right, Professor John Mearsheimer, as always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us uh, ahead of the special occasion of uh, India's hosting of the G20 summit. My pleasure.